Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on structuralism and popular culture. And so we're going to take a look at structuralism in this video and it's going to go hand in hand with our uh, the other mini lecture of this week which is on semiology. So the two are tied together and we just kind of want to keep that in mind as we move forward. So what is structuralism? It attempts to identify underlying assumptions in everyday culture. Not, necessar not necessarily directly invoked through the cultural object. So we're looking for, essentially, I mean, it's in the name, structure. And we're looking for those, those hidden elements. And you can think of this like your, your bone system, right? Your, your skeleton is the structure of your body, but you don't actually see the skeleton. You see just hints of it. Um, you, you don't necessarily at least on the surface, know that there's a skeleton underneath until you start to dig down and look really deep. So, the this is, as I said, closely tied to semiotics, and so we will be looking at that this week as well. And uh, these ideas really emerged out of the, in the early 1900s in trying to just understand that, that bigger picture of what was going on and what was, uh, what was actually recognizable to on the surface in what was down belief that was driving the repetition of things or, or creating the structure across um, culture that we see reinforced time and again. And it, it emerged from Ferdinand de, Sa de Sasso uh, in his work on structural linguistics, which again there, you know, structural linguistics was understanding kind of how language across so many different cultures has a particular structure to it, has certain expectations, has rhythms, and how does that get created? Uh, when, when humans first evolved language, nobody sat down and said, okay, this is a transition, this is a preposition, this is a verb, this, but we can see across languages that there is very common points of, sh of structure within a particular language. Uh, we name things, we, we have actions for things, so this is something that is essentially there, um, but we don't necessarily, we weren't, it wasn't a conscious thing. And I think an important point here, and this is really where it ties in well with popular culture, is that meaning is only possible through its interconnections of other meanings in a larger system frame. So again, if we're thinking language, the English language, the words, right, is only possible as they connect to other meaning systems and the larger frame, which is the language. And so, you know, we we have to be aware of that there is, we can only make sense of things by connecting it to other things that we understand, right? This is a, this is almost learning through analogy and metaphors that you, you know, when you think about learning, there's often a lot of analogy and metaphors used, right? So you're using a c interconnection of meaning in order to connect you to this new idea um, in connection with the, this, these other ideas that you're already familiar with. So when we look at this, um, what we see is there's relational meaning between signifier and signified when dealing with culture as opposed to language. Now signifier is the object, the item, the thing itself, and signified is the larger uh, range of meanings and ideas that it's tapping into. So I can give you two examples, right? So here we have a cross and we have a holy Bible, right? Those are signifiers. If somebody's holding a Bible, if somebody refers to the Bible, if somebody refers to the cross, those are signifiers. And what they're signifying, of course, is Christianity. But they only make sense. That's, uh, that's, that sign system only makes sense if you are, of course, you know, in a culture which has, in some way, shape, or form, identified Christian Christianity. Uh, if you're in a culture that doesn't have Christianity, doesn't know about Christianity, those two things become irrelevant. So this is what we mean by that relation to other meanings. Christianity has to already have been established in order for that for those signifiers to make sense. It has to already tap into an existing network of meanings. And sometimes this isn't going to be perfectly crystal clear cut. You can have signs that are not, uh, that could, or you could have signifiers that could signify different things, whether purposely or, or incidentally. Uh, the peace sign might be a good one. 
so structuralism within culture, why, why do we want to be thinking about this? Um, common themes, myths, beliefs that underlie our culture, right? And so when we look at things like pulp novels, when you look at even, you know, American movies, there are certain themes, and that's part of our structuralism. You know, we, we have certain characters, right? We've talked about the Western and the cowboy and kind of what they tap into within our culture. And so structuralism really does try to get in there and look at these things and unravel them or tie them to their larger... Um, their larger cultural value or their larger understanding. So in our culture, you know, it's it's so many stories focus on kind of overcoming the odds, right? American culture is a big fan of the underdog. And so what does that say? Well, that taps into our larger history. That taps into our ideas about our, our creation in the American Revolution and this idea of we, we defeated or we beat uh, the British Empire, which at the time was a massive empire, and so there, you know, we were the underdogs, or at least that's what we, t these are the things we tell ourselves, and that's the, you know, we see that structure of overcoming insurmountable odds permeate so many different elements within our culture. Uh, we're often unconscious or unaware of it, and by, you know, a good, a good look at, a good, another way to look at structure is through the prism of gender, and kind of what gets delegated or what gets assumed about people, where people are positioned in society, or what people should do, right? There's, there's structure in our culture around gender roles, right? What you can and can't, what you can or should be doing based upon what you are. And we codify this, right? We have the icons of the male and female, even on the bathroom, to indicate, you know, where you fit within the structure. Other places, um, you know, they, they're, they're positioned, or when we're looking at objects and trying to figure out what they signify, right? When we're looking at signifiers, what do they signify? Uh, we have to remember they're positioned in relation to their socio-historical space. And I think books are a great example of that, that if you look at literature, even if you look at movies, right? In order to f in order to understand the different things that it's tapping into, you have to understand the time and place that it comes from, and recognize what were the symbols, what was the you know what was the larger structural dynamics of that time and place. So this is I think is is important uh, when we're when we're looking at television, when we're looking at ethical consumption uh, later in the semester, because I think they they hit upon certain things that are very specific to time and place as essentially shorthand. And they often pit binary modes of classification, right? So male and female, good and bad. Uh, you know, we, we saw it in capitalism and socialism uh, in, the, in the 20th century, right? So they often pit and they often are negotiating or privileging one over the other. And, you know, we see this particularly, I think I've mentioned this before, you know, if you look at the American Film Institute's top 100 films of the first 100 years, it's fascinating how many protagonists are white males. And so what does that tell us about, you know, the, the underlying structure of popular cultures that it has privileged white male as the, you know, as the preferred representation um, to all other types of identity. And then finally, if certain themes, ideas, or concepts reappear, it speaks to pattern. And if it speaks to pattern, it therefore speaks to uh, structure. And so we want to be aware of that, right? On the, on the right here, I have an image of, of an iceberg, and we see the tip of it is above water, and the rest of it is below. And that's kind of how we want to think about structure is we can see bits and pieces of it, right? As I said, if you look at American Film Institute, you can see the vast majority of, of protagonists are, are males, are white males. And so that, that's starting to give us a sense of the structure underneath, which is a privilege of patriarchal and European legacy that, that permeates even into film. Alright, so this is hopefully giving you some things to think about with structuralism. We're going to follow this up with semiology, and they should both together help you start to think about taking signs apart. Thank you very much for watching.